Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Treasures Galore. My name is Michael Elder, and this is my third part of the book review of The Outlaw Trail, A Journey Through Time, written by Robert Redford. Uh, the reason why I'm going over this book, again, is because in The Thrill of the Chase, Forrest Finn mentions Robert Redford, and if he had ever written a book, it'd be better than the Gatsby book. Well, he did, and it is titled The Outlaw Trail, A Journey Through Time. He also brings up Robert Redford again and in the chapter Mountain Man, talking about the movie Jeremiah Johnson who starring Robert Redford. It's a perfect depiction of the Mountain Man. So that's the reason why I'm going over this. Whether it has hints or not, I have no idea. Uh, that's just up to you. So I'm going to use severe confirmation bias in this video, and I'm just going to bring up stuff in this book that I think ties back to the thrill of chase and what's important in that book so you know severe confirmation bias if you do have this book uh, you know and I'm sure that you're gonna see a lot of stuff that I didn't see and there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure you know someone else would read and find interesting so if your solve is in like the Browns Park area I suggest that you probably should get this book it's it's really interesting there's a lot of stuff that you can tie back to it like I said, I don't know if outside literature plays a role in the, the chase or not. As you can tell with all the books behind me, you know, at the beginning of my search in 2015, I really believed that there, you know, could be a possibility of some hints throughout these books that are mentioned, you know, in the thrill of the chase. So, you know, I got them, I read them, none of them really helped me at all, but it's just kind of just a filler time for me to, you know, tell my tell my thoughts about, you know, stuff that I think is important. So that's why I'm doing this, guys. This book, The Outlaw Trail, I mean, it really it really hits home for me because I grew up in Range of Colorado, which is a small town. I think it has like two thousand people in it, if that. So it's in northwestern Colorado. So it's about 55 miles from Vernal, Utah, which Robert Redford talks a lot about. So this whole area, you know, is fairly close to, you know, where I grew up. And, you know, I feel like me and Forrest Finn have a lot in common, you know, besides millions of dollars and, you know, being famous and meeting all these famous people and owning an art gallery and, you know, creating bronzes and hiding a treasure chest. So maybe we don't have that much in common. But as far as Forrest Finn's past, like him growing up, I feel like we sh we sh we share a lot of the same common traits. I can't tell you how many times me and my uh, great granddad, my granddad, my dad have searched the mountains and the hills, you know, in this area, looking for signs of ancient life, and we found a lot of cool stuff. And you know, my family on my dad's side lived in Cortez, and they have. A whole bunch of property and you know it's private property so it's legal and we would go you know looking and we'd find a whole bunch of Indian pottery and I mean we found some really cool stuff so you know going out and just looking for signs of ancient life has been part of my past and it's something that I'm really passionate about and you know in this book talks a lot about the areas that you know me and my dad have you know hiked and looked around for stuff so it just hits home my grandpa was a school teacher and a coach in a small town and I can't tell you how many people have came up to me and said you know you know your grandpa used to give me spankings and stuff like that and you know just kind of reminds me of Forrest Finn talking about his dad being a principal in the small town so just a lot of common things like that you know I feel like you know we're one and the same kinda so I just you know, just really, this book really hits home. There's so many cool areas and Indian stuff and petroglyphs that you could check out in this area. So if you do have a solve in this area, it'd be well worth it, even if you don't find the treasure chest, because it's just awesome. It's awesome to see history like that and, you know, ancient signs of life, you know, lived thousands of years ago. It's, it's cool. It's really cool. So if you do get a chance, if your solve is in that area, go check this this area out is beautiful to me it's not the place Forrest Finn would hide a treasure chest and 
that's coming from a lot because I have no idea where he hit it. But it just seems it's really deserty, and you know he said it's not in the desert, but really deserty. I know there's other places that are beautiful that's not in the desert, but to me it just doesn't fit the bill, and that's just my my opinion. And there's probably about a 99% chance that I'm wrong on that, but just my opinion. So um, I am gonna do a giveaway, guys. This is an pottery that I found on my great granddad's land when I was about I think I was about eight years old is about two inches under the surface so I'm gonna do a giveaway I have a whole bunch of pottery and stuff like that this is probably it, it's all intact it's a really really neat piece so I'm gonna give it away I have I have a lot I have a lot of other stuff you know that really means a lot to me this one you know it is cool but I kinda wanna give a piece of me to my subscribers and kinda do a giveaway like that because you know I'm almost at 700 subscribers I just wanna say thank you guys so to be entered in this you have to be a subscriber so if you're listening and didn't subscribe and you wanna be entered in this uh, subscribe and then in I'll probably give it a week or two weeks and We'll do some sort of comment giveaway or something like that where I entered it in and then randomly it picks out a comment in one of the things. So if you guys haven't subscribed, subscribe. It's pretty cool. Once used by Indians. Pretty cool. So anyways, let's get into the book review of the Outlaw Trail. So again, beautiful country. A lot of this stuff is going to be confirmation bias on my part, and I'm trying to get used to going live, so please forgive me if I make any mistakes or I fumble over my words or something like that. Just trying to get ready to go live. Me and Carter did a test run on uh, yesterday, Saturday, Saturday morning. People, it worked out great. We used Zoom, and it was on uh, YouTube Live, but... For some reason, I think Huli told me that she couldn't hear me talk or it was really, really faint. So that's why I bought this headphones. I don't know if I like it or not. I'm probably going to buy a different speaker, but I went to Best Buy and the one I wanted was like 250 bucks. So maybe if someone sends me some donations, I'll get that. But for right now, I'm just going to use this thing. So, okay. So. That's why I have this headset. I'm just trying to test out the sound. So tell me, you guys, what you guys think. If it's I need to work on something or whatever. Just trying to get ready to go live. Get used to being in front of a camera. So again, forgive me if I make any mistakes. Not a professional. Okay, so I left off on page 119 of the Outlaw Trail. So I'm just going to kind of go through this quick. There's just there's some sentences and stuff. There's a couple themes that I'm going to bring up, but mostly it's just some interesting words that he brings up that I'm just trying to tie back to the thrill of the chase because, well, the thrill of the chase is the most important. So on page 119, he says, At one point, Bob pulled up and stared around, a thoughtful moment, as though sniffling the wind for some clue. So he's sniffing the wind for some clue. Just thought that was interesting. Some of the stuff you're gonna probably be like, "Why are you, why are you bringing up, why are you bringing that up, Mike?" So, just my thoughts. You know, some of the stuff may be kind of far fetched, but that's all right. So on page 122, what is it about the warmth of a fire that so invites imaginary storytelling? So, just kind of make me feel about, think about Forrest Fan. He's always talking about sitting by his his fire late at night. You know. And he writes a whole bunch of stuff in his computer, you know, romantic stuff, he said, I believe. And then he deletes it the next day. So just thought that was interesting. Also, later on, he says, it was like listening to a waterfall. Waterfalls are really, uh, you know, they're really, really used a lot as far as like heavy loads and water high. Or they believe the treasure chest is hidden, you know, under a waterfall. So they're, they're really popular in the chase now Forrest Finn did say why are you guys so obsessed with waterfalls so maybe maybe there is a waterfall maybe there isn't waterfall 
So page 123. It was a place where daughter murdered father and brother murdered brother. Shallow graves were common. So there's, just like I've mentioned, I believe graves are important. No place for the meek. You guys got to check out my previous videos if you haven't. If this is your first time watching, go back and watch my other videos. I believe graves are important. Now, it's not hidden in the graveyard. It's not near there, but I believe it could be one of the clues in the poem. Specifically, no place for the meek. So, again, on this page, 123, this is really interesting. The crude rock pile grave of Indian Joe, a drifter killed by Charlie Krause, who had one of the first ranches out the mouth of the canyon. So, a crude rock pile grave of an Indian. So, in Once Upon a While, he talks about they were searching for this grave with a whole bunch of rocks stacked on top of it. And it was 46 miles north. Now, in a future video, remember 46 miles north. But he also mentions the word crude, like a crudely um, done grave marker, which brings you back to the thrill of the chase again with My War for Me when he trips over the stone grave marker, you know, that's crudely done. So, again, grave markers, a crude rock pile grave just something that I thought was interesting so page 131 the word meeks is brought up so it says by the following August August Cassidy with the aid of Elza Lay Bub Meeks and Jill Walker had successfully pulled off several robberies so there's the word meeks no place for the meek meeks just thought that was interesting page 138 as we walked through the debris and high grass surrounding the place, I couldn't think. I couldn't help but think how many of these old sites that might be now considered monuments have either been destroyed or buried by development or simply rotted away. So he's talking about going through the grass in these old places that, you know, he thinks should be monuments, but they're rotting away and people don't really pay attention to them. So tall grass, another, you know, really, really occurring theme. And the thrill of the chase tall grass so also there's probably 10 mentions of 10 miles in this book 10 miles is a very common too far to walk because of the the preface in too far to walk talking about the walking the river distance and it was about 10 miles and now it's too far for him to walk so i thought that was interesting but he did say when he's talking about the unattended clue he did say that it doesn't take a genius to know what they were talking about, as in what they think the unintended clue was. And so he's talking about the 10 miles. So to me, that almost eliminates 10 miles as too far to walk because it's, well, too easy. Kind of just, you know, says it right out. Maybe he did. Maybe it is 10 miles. I don't know. So page 142. We followed a dry creek bed up through the twisted pinion trees and huge rocks, alive uh, from the past, great splashes of orange growth stood out against the dark gray of the granite rock. From time to time, we would pause and soak up the view and the fruits of the exercise. So they're going through a dry creek bed. No paddle up your creek. And then the twisted pinion trees. And then he talks about the huge rocks. So the dry creek bed, no, no paddle up your creek. And then heavy loads as in these huge rocks just trying to tie stuff back to the poem in the book and later on in this page he talks about we had filmed the opening sequence of jeremiah johnson at this spot so in too far to walk jeremiah johnson is brought up in the chapter mountain men and this one he's talking about there exactly where they filmed the set of jeremiah johnson and they built like this homestead and they used it for the the movie and then they wanted to preserve it so the people around vernal utah and stuff could go check it out and you know it'd be cool well the blm didn't like that and they tore it down which is another common theme of hatred for the government and the blm page 152 we were told that many cabins caves grave sites in fact whole homesteads entire towns had been in unindated by the damming so he's talking about the flaming gorge so 
many grave sites, caves, you know, homesteads were completely destroyed. They didn't even care to, you know, preserve anything. They just filled it up with water and let it destroy everything, which made a lot of people mad in that area, which I don't blame them. So continuing on page 152, on the way to Vernal, we pass through Sheep Creek Canyon, a paradise that appears suddenly and looks like what one expects to find at the end of a rainbow. It was filled with yellow aspens, green fields, and red and black rocks rising like the spirals of a cathedral. The original outlaw trail can still be seen, seen here as it winds up behind the stables to the higher country. So they're going through a canyon and it looks like a paradise and then suddenly you know and it appears suddenly so in the thrill of the chase I talked about you know he talks in my war for me suddenly on the left you know twice and suddenly on a funeral and then he brings up suddenly also going through this canyon so and then he also talks about how beautiful it is and how many different colors and it would it's one it's what one would expect at the end of a rainbow. So brings me back to the thrill of chase with Force Fan mentioning his rainbow. So on page 153 mentions, We came down on the other side of the pine meadow flats where mountain breezes blew the tall grasses like water rippling in a lake. So again, tall grasses. Then he talks about the Anasazi Indians and they drew all over the canyon walls, which is a popular blaze is you know a petroglyph so page 161 i had want i wondered if they had appreciated it or if they had taken such treasures for granted so this kind of just made me think about the chapter treasures galore in too far to walk and that's how i got my channel name and it's kind of where it all clicked in my mind that the treasure chest is hidden in montana now I'm going to go through this and, you know, me and Carter are going to discuss this topic and stuff like that. But if you're simplifying in this interview with Cynthia that she posted a couple weeks ago, he says that oh, people are overcomplicating his book. Well, if you're going to simplify his book, you know, in love with Yellowstone, there's, a, you know, looking for Lewis and Clark. A lot of the mentions of being outside in the mountains is in Montana, talking about how much he loves the place. Too far to walk. The cover is, you know, Madison, the Madison River. And then he talks about how special that country is, and it cemented a special place in his heart. I mean, there's so many instances. Almost 99% of the time he's talking about being in the mountains. He's not talking about being in New Mexico. There's only a few times, to my knowledge, where he actually says that he was in the mountains in Mexico. And one of them is, you know, Tea with Olga, where he flies his plane over Taos Mountain. And there's not many other mentions of that. So if you're going to simplify, to me it makes sense that he's saying it's in Montana. It, it would make sense. Now people are saying, well, it has to be a subtle hint. Well, he can give us a search date. I could hide a treasure chest. I, th I believe I've said this. I could hide a treasure chest on the Grand Mesa. It's a national forest. It's on the biggest flat top mountain in the world. It's about 40 minutes away from me. I could hide a treasure chest up there. And if I didn't give you specific directions exactly how to get there, you would never find it. I could hide something, I guarantee it, and you would never be able to find it, even if I told you exactly where it was, especially if I buried it. So him to give a state is, you know, he could give it away, and it, it still wouldn't help us if we can't figure out where warm waters halt. So to me, him hinting about the state isn't really that big of a deal unless you can find you know where warm waters halt so him for just to spell it out for us and tell us that it's either you know in montana or wyoming maybe he does i mean throughout all of his literature and stuff like that it's all mostly when he's talking about being outside and in the mountains and his experiences 99 percent of it is in montana west yellowstone you know that area and just like Treasures Galore, it talks about hiking, how much, this is why I'm, I'm going to tie it back to the book, I promise. So he talks about the, 
they took the treasures for granted. Well, in Too Far to Walk, Treasures Glory talks about the treasures of trapezing through the hills and mountains in Montana. And he says that every time a mosquito landed on my arm, 15 of his relatives came to the funeral. Well, there's also another chapter in Once Upon a While, his third book, where he says Montana Golden. And he's talking about golden trout at Avalanche Lake, but he labeled it Montana Golden. And then also Treasures Galore, talking about winner-take-all proof of personal fulfillment. So Treasures Galore, you hit a treasure, Montana Golden, gold was in there. And he uses the same line about the mosquitoes of his relatives. So, you know, just it makes sense in my mind that the treasure chest is very well likely in Montana or Wyoming. And I could go off on completely tang a different tangent with that, but I'm going to try to stick to this book review for now. So page 164. So the roost is identical by two flat top buttes on the edge of the flat facing east and north. It provided the outlaws with caves in which to store their weapons, bunkhouses, saloons, and such essentials as disguised hollowed out trees for the posting of letters and messages. Isolated from the settlements by miles of desert and box canyons, it was almost inaccessible except to the few who knew the route. The many lawmen, brave or foolish enough to penetrate the refuge, were lost in the mazes. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in this. So he's talking about caves, which the treasure isn't hidden in a cave, but he's talking about this the robber's roost, you know, provided outlaws with hideouts, and they would stick stuff, messages and bottles and stuff like that, in these hollowed out trees, or disguised as trees. So... If you are brave and in the wood, could that be a hint of how he hid the treasure chest? Him putting it out in a hollow tree? Maybe. But I also thought it was interesting that he says the, um, the box canyons. Box canyons are very popular with some searchers, I believe. You know, get inside the box. People think it means box canyon. Whether that's right, I don't know. It was almost inaccessible, except to the few who knew the route. And many lawmen, brave or foolish enough to penetrate the refuge, were lost in the mazes. So, I just thought that was interesting. It's almost inaccessible unless you know the route. You know, just like Why Must I Go brought up. What if there's just one route in, in here in to, you know, to find the treasure chest? And they were also brave to try. So, just thought that was really interesting. Page 168. He says, The Henry Mountains, 60 miles to the west, were ablaze with the first light. So, the blaze coming on the mountain, or the sun coming on the mountain, you know, and it set it ablaze. Now, if your blaze is a mountain or something big, I believe that you are wrong. Because I believe Forrest Fenn has stated that, you know, it has to be a specific spot. It has to be where you see it, look down. So logically to me, it has to be some small, small marker to point, pinpoint an exact location. Else you're not going to be able to just look down. You know, if you're at a mountain, there's, I mean, how many miles do you have to search to find a blaze if it's a whole mountain? So I believe that is one specific spot and also it has to be above ground level. Because if you're looking, if you look quickly down, you know, that means you have it has to be somewhat above ground level or above it. So logically, again, to me, that would make it either a rock or a tree, a mark on a rock or a tree. What else could be above ground level to mark something in the mountains since it's not hidden near a structure? So page 176. There's one thing about the wind chill factor once it sets in. You are finely and firmly cold. So he talks about the coldness of the mountains and, you know, kind of ties back to the poem about being cold. So this is, this is also interesting, and this is confirmation bias, 100%. So 
He says, no one mentioned what we were thinking, that this was a, as far away from any road as we had been, some 50 miles or so. So I believe too far to walk is 50 miles, and that comes from the thrill of the chase using the keyword home, the long ride home, so as in the home of Brown. So there's a long ride to the home of Brown. In that chapter, he talks about getting kicked out of the car, and he was in between Shoshone and Casper. The distance between those two towns is exactly 99 or 100 miles, depending on how you measure it. So it's 100 miles, pretty close. And if he's in between those, then it'd be 50 miles, you know, walking one way. So he's walking on the paved road. He talks about how cold it was getting. That's another, I believe that's another key word, cold. He's walking on the road. I, he doesn't have shoes on, which is another, you know, interesting theme that I'm going to bring up. And it was so far away they didn't have coyotes out there. So... It's the only place where Forrest Finn's walking and he mentions how far it is and he actually gives us a distance by men mentioning these two towns and he's between these two towns. So that's how I get 50 miles. A lot of people think that's too far. It, it could be, but if you can show me a, you know, too far to walk in the book that's better than that, I would love to hear it because I cannot find one. So confirmation bias, but he mentions, I think it's interesting they mentions it was far away and it was about 50 miles or so. So page 195, some guys who read it, excuse me, some guys who read it all out of the book, no practice ex or experience telling y'all it's the same as it used to be. So he's talking about the people who work for the government, especially the BLM talking about how the land's drying up and it's changing and this guy you know with a suit in an office who's never even been out there has no experience is telling them that they're wrong so it really reminds me of Forrest Finn um you know how he talks about getting a education and he's too old for it and he's talking about you know some of the things that he does good is better than the guys who have the college degrees so just thought that was interesting. Re reoccurring theme of hatred for the BLM, the government, and they don't know anything. They're just sitting in their offices. They've never been out, you know, been out here looking around. And, you know, it's a common thing in Colorado, too, is that I live on the western slope, and which is a more conservative, you know, small town. And the majority of the population in Colorado lives in, like, Denver or Boulder, which is Democrat. It's more more liberal area so since they have the population over there they vote and that kind of dictates what happens on the western slope which is you know which i don't think is right because we we live completely different on this side of the state so i feel for forrest finn and robert redford and the ranchers who are talking in this book so the last point i'm going to bring up is page 202 and he's talking about the Anasazi Indians and how they settled um, in Mesa Verde in Colorado around uh, 700 AD. The Mesa Verde civilization thrived for about 600 years, marked by great advances in basket weaving and pottery. Then around AD 1300, it suddenly disappeared, possibly as a result of a drought that is known to have lasted for 30 years. So, as we all know, Forrest Fang got his bracelet. Uh, in a, he won it from Byron Harvey, I believe, in a pool game, but it was a bracelet of these Indian beads of Richard Weatherall going down into uh, Mesa Verde for the first time, and he found these beads. He had uh, this Indian polish it up and make a bracelet out of it. So just thought that was interesting. I know some people are believe that treasure chest is hidden, you know, somewhere in the Mesa Verde National Park. So just brought that up for you guys. So that's that's it for this this uh, book review. I'm gonna I picked a searcher to send this book to. He gave me his address. I'm gonna put it in the mail, and he's gonna read it and go through it. And then he told me that he's gonna keep it going, and so I'll keep in contact with him. So if another searcher feels like they want to read this book, or if there's something that I missed, or you know it's really important to you, you know I'll have him send it to you, and then maybe we could just keep this thing going now i did highlight in the book i had no intentions of you know sending my books out 
to other searchers, you know, when I first started the chase. So I did mark in stuff because, well, I got obsessed and I didn't really care about the books. I just wanted to find the treasure. So I marked in everything and that's how all my books are. So anyways, he's going to keep it going. I think that's interesting. Uh, my next book will probably be, probably be 80, I believe, or or if some other searcher wants me to go through a book that they believe is important that I have, then I can go that route too and pick that book. So I don't have any other Forrest Finn books besides his memoirs. If you do have one and you have it and you want to send it to me so I can read it and go over it, make a video about it, and then I can send it back to you after or if someone wants to donate money for me to buy it and go through it and then send it to some other searcher too or send it back to them or you know whatever works so I'm just gonna go through the books that I have right now and then if someone donates or something I can go you know through the other books or whatever later so I, I would think it was in, I do think it's interesting to go through the other Forrest Finn books besides the memoirs to get a better understanding of who he is and you know kinda of just a background more background information like the San Lazaro Pueblo or his book about Eric Sloan which could be you know really interesting now Forrest Finn said there's not hints in those books but he didn't say it couldn't help you understand him or you know get a better understanding of the guy who hid the treasure chest so anyways so that's it for this video I hope you guys liked it again like subscribe this this video and I'm gonna give this Indian pottery away so it's little, it's about, I don't know, two or three inches, fully intact, has some pretty cool grooves on it. So, uh, subscribe to the channel, and in video, I'm going to give it like one or two weeks for everyone to subscribe, and then you can, we'll do a comment, like I said before, you can make a comment, and then I'll do a random comment thing, or you can email me your name, and whatever, or however we want to go about this, so... Anyways, like, subscribe, and I hope you guys like the video. Again, I don't know how much how many hints are in these books or whether this is just a complete waste of time. You know, I'm just doing that, letting you guys decide. the The book has went over so many times. You know, I think it. I think you'd be, you know, discounting yourself if you didn't at least look into these books just to see, you know, what it's about and what's said in these books. So I will say this, and this is going to be something that might make some people mad. I don't know. I'm so tired of tiptoeing around stuff. But Forrest Finn, if you haven't watched Alan Kay's video about the Norman Rockwell paintings and how they tie back to the Thrill of Chase illustrations, do that. And as I go through these books, like the Journal of the Trapper and uh, what is that other, the other book about Colton Hawfield, I believe. It's the Catcher in the Rye. Sorry, I completely butchered that. When you go through these books, there's so much stuff that Forrest Finn, I'm not going to say stole, but that he borrowed and put it in the Thrill of the Chase. I mean, stuff that's just undeniably really similar. And so, just like the illustrations, I mean, they're so close to Norman Rockwell paintings. I mean, is this kind of a nod to his past about him selling the the forgeries, you know, of the paintings? Did he do that just to, you know, get a laugh out of it? I don't know. But, I mean, there's no denying that some of this stuff is directly taken from other literature or paintings or illustrations and put in the thrill of the chase. There's a lot. A lot of different sayings and, you know, poems and stuff just put in there. And maybe that's, you know, how Forrest Finn wanted to design it is to put a whole bunch of outside stuff in there to draw people off into going into rabbit holes. So, I don't know, guys. Tell me what you guys think. Hopefully, you guys like this book review. I will be making another video and then hopefully uh, going to be doing a live video sometime this week, I hope. We're going to have to get it all down and kind of come up with a topic and plan it out so hopefully sometime this week or in the next two weeks we're going to go live so again subscribe to the house husband diaries we're going to go live on his channel for the first few times and then 
he's going to teach me how to do it on my channel and then we're going to do that also rodney green way uh he wants to make some appearances on here and we might do something on his channel or on our channel so it's awesome rodney greenway is going to join in and then also octopus dick said that he might make some appearances also so again rodney and octopus sticks they love they love the book uh, just as much as i do along with carter with the house husband diaries so i'm super excited i think you guys are going to love it heavily book oriented and i was talking with carter the other day and he's like he wants to go out with a bang so let's start out with where warm waters halt which is the most important clue because if you don't know where to start, then, you know, you might as well stay at home and play Canasta. So we're going to start off with a bang. We're going to go over where Walmart's halt, all the possible where Walmart's halts in the book and, you know, and try to tie it back to the poem. And that's what we think is the most important. So I'm, I'm really excited. So make sure you subscribe to the House of Diaries and subscribe to mine to be entered into the drawing for this. So. Anyways, hope you guys liked it. I will catch you guys on the flip side.